Hey folks, welcome to Roll of Law. A lot of people who are interested in tabletop role-playing or other geeky pursuits are also interested in crafting, and often those interests intersect. So one project that I quite like is if you're playing a spellcasting character, I quite like making a little spell book for them, because that way I can copy out the relevant spells that are useful to my character, the ones that my character actually knows, and have them in a convenient reference book. And it's also kind of a cool prop. So I made one that I'm going to show you how I made, and that is right here. This one is, uh, this one was a fair bit of work, but it's got a fun design to it. You can see I've sort of got it with a lava pattern. I kind of envisioned this one as being something for like some kind of fire wizard. And you can see how this would be a great prop. Not only do you have your spells listed, but you know, you can hold this up and gesture as your character is casting a spell. That's, that's a lot of fun. That's pretty cool. So I wanted to show you guys how I made this one. And then I'll also talk about how you could make it in other designs. Because for instance, I also made this one previously. And so while this one might be good for sort of a fire wizard, uh, this one was made for a character of mine who's a conjuration wizard. So I've got it with sort of a dragon scale pattern on it as well as a symbol that I found online. I actually reached out to the person who designed the symbol. They said it was okay to do this. So um, that's a, always a good practice. But, you know, you can design this in a variety of different ways. Anything from really simple to a lot more complicated and effortful. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the at the end about how you can make this in a really simple way because this doesn't have to be a super difficult project. Um, I made this and this one was, you know, this is a fairly intensive project, but I'll also talk about how you can do something similar, how you can make a spell book like this yourself that wouldn't take a whole lot of special tools or training. So let's dive right in. All right, I'm going to bring up the video here and we'll just play it along. Uh, I'm just going to note that at points, uh, this video is usually sped up uh, at seven and a half times speed in places, 20 times speed in some places, and in some places, 50 times. All right, here we go. So I'm starting off with a square of leather, and the square here is uh, basically, it's just going to be a rectangle shape, but I also, I bought this hardware and the, uh, the paper for it. This is A5 hardware, so it's kind of, I think that's a good size, but to measure it out, you can, you're gonna make a square, uh, basically just see uh, one half of it and how it fits and then add a couple of inches just to make sure that you're going to cover that uh, that bend. If you're not sure you can always make it too big. You're going to be able to cut it down later on in the process if you need to but you can't add anything back. So now what I'm going to be doing here is I'm applying and again this is at seven and a half times speed uh, I'm applying what's called deglazer, and deglazer basically is just a cleaner. It takes gunk off of this so that it's able to soak in water properly and take other treatments. And here I'm spraying it down with some water, and that's just to soften it for the next steps, because um, I want it to be a little damp for what I'm doing next. And The sprayer I got from Tandy Leather, it's a really good sprayer, it does a very fine mist. And I really, um, really appreciate that. It's quite useful. All right, so that's me showing the little uh, sort of test strip. Now this is using a swivel knife and a swivel knife is great for this. Um, and basically I'm just carving out little blobby shapes um, and leaving sort of gaps. This is what's going to be those black um, patterns that you see. So the black patterns I'm carving those out right now uh, I can tell you there's one big consideration that was on my mind as I was carving these sort of blobby shapes out which is that I really didn't want any of them to look like a dog because um, if you do um, somebody is gonna notice and they're gonna comment and then that's all anyone's gonna see and they're just gonna mock it so um, I know that kind of sounds silly but that was something I was that was on my mind was just you know I want blobby shapes but I don't want any of them to look um, I don't want anybody to sort of be able to make uh, snarky comments about them 
So yeah, just carving blobbies. Um, you can get a, uh, this is a very nice swivel knife, but you can get a fairly inexpensive one at, you know, Tandy Leather or other leather supply places. I recommend that if you're going to do a project that involves this kind of tooling, that uh, a swivel knife is really helpful. Um, they just make it a lot easier and you're not really going to be able to get the same effect with some other kind of knife. So just sort of going through and basically this is just kind of a, this is just, it just takes a while. All right. And you can make these sort of whatever random shape. Um, it also occurred to me that the same pattern would actually work just as well for an ice wizard. I'd just use different colors. So instead of the black and red, I would probably be uh, going with white for the uh, the blobbies, and then filling that in with like a white, like a different shade of white and blue, sort of uh, to make like river waves between them. So it would look like icebergs floating in, a, in water. Um, I think that would also look cool. It's not what I did this time, but it's a perfectly, it would be a perfectly viable project. So there we go. Now that I've got all of these carved out, I'm breaking out my tools because I want to stamp down all of the space in between. Now this part I'm doing at 50 times speed because um, it took a while. So, yeah. Oh, and um, I had a cutting board over top of my granite slab for a bit there. I removed that because I'm going to get better stamps. Uh, the purpose of the granite slab is that you want a big sort of inert mass um, so that you've got a lot of inertia that helps you get a good stamp. Um, they will sell you a granite slab somewhere. Uh, I find that the easiest way to do that is actually find a place that does granite uh, countertops and they always will be throwing out waste. If you go into their trash bin, you can get a block just like this one and you can see it's got the rough edges it's because I dug this one literally out of a trash can um, and it works great. to be careful as you do this stamping because any you can't unstamp something so any stamp that you make that you regret well you're stuck with it uh, there's a certain amount of stuff you can fix uh, doing leather work but not everything so this is a place to be careful as I mentioned this is at 50 times speed so you can see how long it takes to sort of do with some precision moistening it you're gonna have to keep doing that over time just to get it and you'll get a feel if you do this for the right kind of level of moisture uh, stamping all of this down gets us a couple of benefits one uh, it gives it some texture uh, both in terms of the difference between the raised area and the lower area and because the lower area itself now has some texture but uh, that difference between the raised area and the stamped down area is also going to be really useful when I get to the taping stage, which is going to be coming up in a little bit here. So.
as much as this process is slow and takes a fair bit of time, um, it's also really kind of satisfying in a weird way. Just you can see the progress as you go. Um, it's got sort of a clearly defined endpoint. Um, I I find this quite relaxing in its own way. The other thing when you're doing this kind of stamping is that it's important to kind of layer the stamping over top of each other and turn your tool so that it's not, um, you want to kind of blend it in so that you don't actually see the shape of the tool at the end of it. Uh, ideally you should be getting a sort of consistent pattern. So if you're seeing the, um, the imprints of your tool as you go, then you're, you're needing to sort of walk it over the surface. And that's just something you can sort of figure out pretty easily with practice. It's not uh, not super difficult to figure out what's going on there. Now, all of this is just embellishment, right? So this is not, strictly speaking, necessary. You can get a really nice product out of the end of this without doing all of this steps that I'm taking here. So um, as much as this is neat, this is stuff that at the end of this, I'll be telling you you don't need to do if you want to do this as the simple means. And that also means that you don't necessarily need as many tools as I'm using here. Um, you can probably do without the uh, the block and the, the, you know, the mallet and so forth if you're just doing a very simple version. Um, you'll probably need a mallet, I don't, but you can get a cheap uh, sort of plastic hammer you don't want to use a metal hammer for any of these tasks because it'll mess your tools up. But uh, uh, here's where I jumped to 50 times speed. Before I think it was just at 20. So. Once in a while you gotta re-add moisture and then let it dry or let that soak in uh, just to get it to the right uh, consistency. Um, this is uh, what's called casing the leather although I'm doing sort of a, a quick case or kind of a lazy case method but uh, there's various guides on how to case the leather if you're trying to do leather tooling. There we go. Now any substantial leather tooling project takes forever, but now um, this is after another day has passed. I've got the airbrush out. I've got uh, 
USMC black uh, die. Uh, that die is just sort of black on black. It's very, very dark, which is exactly what we're looking for here. Also, wear breathing protection if you're using an airbrush and uh, paint, because this stuff doesn't work well on your lungs. But now I'm just going over it with the airbrush. The airbrush is really nice because it uses a lot less paint or dye than, um, than brushing or the like, but it also gets you a nice, uh, even, consistent look. So, now I'm putting multiple coats on just to make sure that I get all of the different uh, places. That's also why I turn it, because the airbrush can sometimes have um, sort of dye shadows, and by turning it repeatedly as I go, I can avoid those being a problem. There we go, it's all nice and dyed black here. And now the next step is I'm going to uh, put a tape on it. This is a special, um, it's a special form of masking tape that is specifically built to, uh, for airbrush masking. And it's really useful because it's kind of thin and you can kind of see through it a little bit. So it's gonna make things a lot easier when I'm uh, later crimming this down. So. The next step here is just applying this, uh, just going to cover it with tape and then we're going to cut the tape up. So you can see uh, this is kind of the process here. Again, this is the process that I'm following for this, but uh, different projects you might be doing different things. But I'm showing you how I made this one. Now that it's all taped, I am very carefully feeling around the edges of those raised ridges. Um, this is where they're really helpful, and I'm starting to slice through between those places. Um, so I'm just trimming that, and uh, we're going to end up with uh, the tape masking just the sort of islands in there, and not the sort of rivers between them. So see uh, as we go here I'm gonna be able to start peeling stuff off this was also very satisfying <laughs> believe it or not uh, it's uh, just one of those uh, kind of tasks that feels feels very rewarding very satisfying as you go and as you uh, as you get further along although a little nerve-wracking as you're sort of worrying about uh, worrying about not screwing it up. Of course, if you did screw it up, at this stage it's pretty fixable. I mean, you just put another piece of tape down and then cut around it. I think I actually did have to do that at one point. So um, this is one of those stages where thankfully it's hard to mess up too badly. sharp knife for this. I'm using a scalpel. You could probably use uh, like a utility uh, utility knife with replaceable blades would probably also work. Um, those are what I use to cut the leather into uh, the square shape. So 
if you don't have a scalpel handy, that'll probably work just fine. Uh, you can also get a scalpel for pretty cheap. Uh, you can order them online with blades. Um, so, an X Acto knife would also work. Lots of options. I did pretty good on avoiding suggestive blobbies. having to uh, I overcut so I had to put on a little patch uh, of tape and that wasn't a big deal so this is again one of those stages that uh, is thankfully forgiving because some other stages aren't Now I've got it taped everywhere except those little islands. And once again, I'm going to break out the airbrush. Uh, this time I'm going to break out the airbrush with uh, a nice orange paint. Uh, so this is a paint, um, this is a paint that's specially designed for airbrushing onto leather and it's great stuff. So now it's going to take multiple coats here because I'm spray paint like airbrushing onto the black. Um, that's harder to get it sort of thorough, but I'm gonna just apply multiple coats until we've got uh, a good, nice orange color all the way through. So that's what I'm doing here. Again, the airbrush is great for getting even, nice color. Um, this is so much more convenient than trying to do this with a paintbrush. said you could do this project with a paintbrush. It would be possible. So, keeping on going with the... And now I've switched to red. Uh, what I'm doing with the red is I'm outlining each of these little blobbies by spraying sort of around them. Uh, what I'm getting there is I'm getting a red edge to all of that. And so this means that between those uh, sort of river patterns, I'm gonna have red and orange. And it's gonna be a blended color that looks much nicer. Um, if I just did the red or just the orange in between, it wouldn't look nearly as nice. So that's, uh, that's what I'm doing right here. It's basically just going around and edging it and then that's going to give me that nice sort of uh, magma look that I'm really going for here as opposed to uh, as opposed to something else so this is a pretty quick stage overall and then 
once that's done, I will be ready to take tape off. I think there I'm actually cleaning out the airbrush behind the scenes. Just off camera. Alright, so now I'm just peeling all the tape and you see how the tape um, masked out from the airbrush. It protected those black portions. So now I've got the, uh, the lovely pattern of the black and uh, orange and red. All of this tape just goes in the trash. It's unfortunate that it's a uh, kind of waste, but it is what it is. It's part of the uh, part of the process. Alright, so now I'm using a tool that's an edger, um, and the edger is just sort of a blade in a fancy assembly, and basically I'm just using that, I'm peeling uh, bits off the side. Uh, that creates a sort of rounded edge, which is going to be much nicer than if you just sort of leave it as a square edge. Uh, you want to uh, sort of round that off so that um, it's nice when you've got good edges on a project. In fact, if you look at um, if you look at leatherwork, um, edges are one of the things that I look at to determine if there's quality to the product. Because um, good edging is uh, it takes some time, and so it's kind of a, a metric of whether somebody's putting care and attention into a project. But now that I've got that shaved off, that's uh, I'll have sort of a rounded thing and now I'm picking some sandpaper and I'm just going over and I'm removing some of the rough um, the roughness to it I'm just uh, trying to smooth it out we're gonna smooth it out even further in another step using a you know a chemical but uh, for right now we're just trying to remove some of the fuzzy bits basically I'm also sandpapering a little bit on the back to try to try to remove that as well because I it's nice if you've got a nice inner surface as well uh, your inner surface is always going to be kind of fuzzy you can't make it perfect like the outside um, just because it's the inside of the uh, of the skin there and there I'm just wiping off bits of sort of fuzzy sandpapered off leather that got stuck to the front all right, so I'm throwing on gloves because at this point I'm applying some black dye to the edges. That's just so that they uh, kind of fit with the rest of it. And sadly, some of this you can't see just because it's not on the screen, but uh, yeah, just going on applying that all the way along the edges just so that we've got uh, a nicely colored edge. Now I'm just taking the airbrush and I'm putting some uh, black dye on the back as well just so that it's got um, just so that we can make the inside look nice this is not a necessary step you can skip it if you'd like uh, you can also get around this by lining it with something um, in this case I'm using the the bare sort of flesh side of the leather but you could put a, a liner in if you put a liner in, you're going to want it open around the middle, around the hinge, because otherwise it won't, won't work very well. But uh, you 
can certainly put a liner in just to uh, avoid the flesh side issues. It can look a lot nicer, but it requires some sewing and various other things. The other advantage to a liner is you can also make that into a pocket. So uh, the chemical I'm using here is called tokenol. Uh, you can also use gum tragacanth, and uh, I'm also using a wooden slicker. It's just a, a wooden sort of shape there. But basically, you just rub it along the edges, and you rub in that tokenol stuff uh, to try to uh, smooth out the edges. Uh, so you use those grooves, and you're uh, you're essentially just using that to press the the stuff in. Uh, the tokenol is kind of a, it's a glue, it's kind of a consistency of like white glue, it's kind of a paste, and um, it helps smooth those down and get you a nice, uh, a nice finish at the end of the day, because you don't want your, your edges to be kind of fuzzy and, and unpleasant. And again, um, leather workers look, when we look at other leather workers work, uh, one of the things we want to look at is, are their edges done well? Because it's a place that's easy to cut corners, and uh, so, yep, just now that's what I'm doing, is going over and tidying up those edges to make them look nice. Here I'm applying some tokenol on the, uh, the back surface as well to smooth it out because the flesh surface uh, is naturally quite fuzzy and this is going to smooth it out. Um, it's not, again, it's not going to look as good as sort of the, uh, the other side, but it will get you a nice uh, flatter sort of, uh, takes that issue out. All right, and then now we're basically pretty close to done. I'm just going to apply a, uh, uh, a preservative top coat to it, and that's just going to protect it. So this you can buy, there's various chemicals that you can buy that uh, provide a top coat. Um, so I'm just uh, applying that just to uh, ensure that, you know, it's maybe a little bit of waterproofing. Um, also, you know, wear proofing. So this is always a good idea to, uh, to do. And I kind of rushed this one because I was impatient. So instead of fully waiting for it to dry, I was using these cups. I don't recommend that. Um, but patience is not really an attention deficit virtue, so um, the cups are to keep it from sticking to the paper. And they worked out fairly well, but uh, still it would have been better to just wait and then turn it over and do the other side. All right, so there's our finished uh, product there in terms of the thing. And that's a little hole punch tool. So I'm just, uh, and I've got it sort of pre-measured. Now, I'll let you in on something. I did not get those holes quite lined up as well as I should have. Um, so they're a little off, but it still works. It's still, it's not perfect, but it still works. Um, and you can buy this hardware on Amazon, as I mentioned. It's just A5 binder hardware, it comes with the, uh, the screws, and those just screw right in. Um, if you want, you can throw a little bit of Loctite in there and just to make sure they're perfectly preserved. So, and then once we've got that, we can throw a little bit of paper in there. So far, we're doing pretty good. There's one last step that I'm going to do here, which is you can buy some corner protectors. Uh, the corners can otherwise get beat up, and those corner protectors, just you slide them on, you sort of hammer them down, and they work just fine. So um, that's basically the uh, that's basically the process. Now I mentioned that I would tell you how to go about doing this in a much quicker fashion. So 
So um, you cut your leather sort of rectangle out and there's various ways. You don't even need to tool anything on it. You don't need to make any sort of pattern. Uh, you could, for instance, just like apply a die um, and you don't need an airbrush. You could just apply that with like a, you know, a sponge or a brush or whatever else. Uh, so you could color it like a monotone green or something like that. And then put in the uh, the hardware, like put in the uh, the binder hardware. And I would still recommend the corner protectors because those corner protectors, um, the corners are the place that's going to get the most um, damage over time. Even if you just leave it as raw leather and just, you know, just put in the binder hardware, it'll still look all right. And in fact, the raw leather will look better over time than it does initially. Um, so this is a very accessible project if you just cut out all of those intervening steps of the decoration. Uh, the decoration itself is where this gets to be a little more challenging. Um, it might take you a few tries to get this to work out right, but you could probably make one of these for not too much. Uh, the other thing is you're going to want fairly thick leather for this somewhere in the six to eight ounce range and it doesn't need to be nice leather there's going to be you know if you go to the leather shop they'll have uh, different grades and you can really do this with like the utility grades the really kind of ugly leather um, in fact one thing that i think can make a really nice look is if you find the ugliest most weathered piece you can and then just go and apply something called like uh, gel antique and if you ask at your leather shop about gel antique they can hook you up with some of that they can sort of talk about it but uh, to really emphasize those different defects and those problems but uh, at the end of the day you end up with sort of a, a cool product as i mentioned you know i've got a couple of these i'll probably make some more of them um, the ones i have all have little defects these are all sort of each one of them's got some problem with it, but they work great at the table. Um, and you can really, this is one of those things that uh, looks really good. It's really convenient as well, uh, because you don't necessarily want to have the spell book that, uh, you know, you don't want to necessarily have to go to the player's handbook to check your spells each time. You, If you've got it in your spell book, that's fantastic. And it just, it looks pretty awesome. So, um, I wanted to share this project with you, wanted to sort of show you that. Um, there's also other things you can do. You can make covers that'll fit over your existing RPG book cover and then, you know, sort of jazz that up. Uh, if you are really industrious, you might be able to rebind those and do some book binding, but that's a much more advanced project. Um, you can make, uh, if you're doing leather work, you can make, uh, you know, coasters, you can make dice trays. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you can make uh, for this. I've found that making little uh, little props and so forth can sometimes add to the game. Um, I've occasionally given out people like a magic item with like a little token of something I've crafted. So all of these things can be a lot of fun. Anyway, I hope that you uh, enjoyed seeing that. I hope you, uh, you know, and if you try it out, let me know. Uh, let me know how it goes. As I said, the first few times you may need to take a few runs at it, but that's how this goes. Uh, the first step of towards being good at something is sucking at it a bunch. And um, yeah, so dive right in. This is a fun project. And um, yeah, until then, see you next time.